Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right, good morning. Good morning. So uh, you've been hearing a lot about wireless, and you will continue to hear a lot about wireless in the next several days. And I thought I will do something slightly different, uh, 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 talk a little bit about mobile, which as Ram says is completely related to wireless. Now everything I say is uh, uh, fairly fundamental and very applicable to any wireless systems that you might decide to build or you might decide to go. While most of the talks that I, as I've heard have focused, when you think about wireless, uh, uh, most people tend to focus on the physical layer, the Mac layer, maybe the architecture, right? I view wireless uh, slightly differently. I view, view it from a systems perspective. So to me, it's an end to a means. And yes, I'm going to optimize the layers below and make sure I extract the most juice out of them. But to me, it's about connectivity. So yesterday, when I gave a talk, you can sort of think about I, I didn't I did talk about Mac protocols a little bit, right? I did talk about discovery and things like that. But really, it was a larger access view. It was about access and how do you uh, do this? Today I'm going to talk about mobile computing, which is that once you have the access, how do you use it and what the issues are. Hi, right, I'm going to introduce a new concept called cloudlets. You've all heard of the cloud. Is there anybody who's not heard of the cloud? If you raise your hands, please leave. Just joking. Okay. So um, let's start. Let's get you going a little bit. So first few slides are just uh, you know again one of those obligatory slides. So. I got this slide from uh, Satya. If you don't know him, he's a uh, professor at Carnegie Mellon. He's, he's a pretty well-known guy. He's done a lot of work on mobile computing for a long time. And he was presenting this, and I thought it was sort of a neat graph. So you heard about Moore's Law. You hear about you know, how uh, uh, you can't, re uh, uh, these days you actually hear the processor speech. You can't really go up, so you're going to have a multitude of processor. You hear about specialized hardware. But the interesting thing about this graph is that all through the centuries, the one thing that has not really changed and will never change is how human attention is. Um, is so, and so what mobility has done for us is it's actually put a lot more tax on the computers than it ever had in the past, right? So um, when you have a phone and you're looking at it, most likely you're actually doing other things while looking at the phone. You're walking, you're driving, you're doing other things as primary activities, and then this is uh, happening. So you don't have the patience to, to do the research. For example, if you do search on a desktop, you can wait. And if it gets lots of links with uh, uh, different things, you can continue pressing on links. On mobile, you actually need to find, when you do a search, you really want an answer right away. right? And so the point is that uh, <clears throat> the, because the human attention is of such a limited resource, and you want answers very, very quick. There is a lot of stuff that we have done in the software over the many, many decades that can that is directly applicable to mobile space. Now, the uh, so so some examples I list here: machine learning, activity, conference, context awareness. And as you sort of look at literature here, you start to see that all these things are applicable, and they are got some really strong, good algorithms to do great things. And so you want to apply them. But the problem is that this device, even though the smartphones these days are pretty uh, powerful, they're not powerful enough to do a lot of this stuff. They just can't. Either they are battery limited, or they are bandwidth limited because you can't get that much data there, or they sort of like just are processor limited, and you're not going to be able to do everything very fast. Okay, so that's the whole uh, whole point. Now, so that just says that okay, so we need help. The device needs help. So one thing is. Well, cloud has so much resources. It's got like you know, uh, thousands, tens of thousands of servers, and you can. So, what if you offload some of the computation to the cloud? Then you can do a lot more on the device. Makes sense. That's great. But between the cloud and the device, there is the internet and there is the wireless uh, access channel, correct? And the thing is, if you don't manage that well, then no matter how fast you want to do, it's not going to still solve your problem. Right. If you want to do augmented reality, if you're looking at your phone, you want something to show up, you want to do it in the cloud, if it takes forever for the data to go back and forth, it costs a lot of money, then it's not going to happen. All right. So what we're going to do is um, I will talk a little bit about computation in the cloud, but I will really focus this talk on latency. 
It's fairly simple fundamental concept in networking and we're going to see how latency impacts and then how potentially we can improve latency. All right. So before I do, let me just uh, start with this uh, few quotes. These are uh, pretty well-known personality. Marisa Myers is now the CEO of Yahoo, as you know, and this is a quote when she uh, was at Google. Uh, similarly, there's somebody from Google Search. Uh, this is a guy from Microsoft. And as you read this, you sort of see latency actually translates to money. And in fact, the reason I have this quote is not really for you. I actually presented this talk to several executives and uh, uh, most of these business execs are much more about the money, right? So I'm going to spend, you're asking me to spend so much money to improve latency, but show me the money. And it turns out that there is money here. There's a tremendous amount of money, as some of these guys have done. And we have quantified it uh, even more to say that if, you're, you know, if you don't do things fast enough, you're going to lose revenue because potentially you can't you know, offer those services. And secondly, if some of your competitors are offering it, then you're going to be able to, uh, they're going to go to that place, all right? So, so uh, this is not just an abstract sort of a technical concept and, and good feel good concept. Now, going back to the competition part, these are some of the applications you kind of are familiar with. You know, you talk to Siri, Cortana is now in Microsoft's. You augmented reality I talked about, some interactive gaming. Uh, this is uh, for any kind of Internet of Things, sensing, that sort of thing. In each of these instances, again, you need a lot more computing horsepower than you have. And so even though these applications exist today, they are not even close to what you can do if you had tremendous amount of computation power. Now, uh, here's an example of a, a very simple thing that a guy in my group, Mathai, Mathai did. So what he's doing is he's walking around. He's got a variable computer, a uh, variable camera, and he's figuring out. You can't see this. I know I tried to, but the PowerPoint didn't come out. This is, oh, yeah, you can see this red dot. So you see the red dot, and that is where he's moving, okay? So instead of doing location uh, determination, like the way Kyle talked about or some of the other stuff that people talk about, with RSSI, signal strengths, or um, um, you know, time of uh, flights or things like that, this is actually done uh, based on vision. So essentially, the camera is, is uh, looking at what's happening. And based on that, it's telling you where in the building you are. Now, it's, it's a toy application, not done for any uh, product use, but it's sort of done to show the power uh, of, of uh, computation and the ability of a computer to be able to do that. Now, for this, you needed a desktop class machine, um, you know, heavy duties with lots of CPU, lots of memory, you know, packed at uh, close to 100% CPU trying to do the analysis in real time. Now, if you want to build a wearable device, okay, you hear so much about Google Glass or anybody else wants to build a vision analytic thing, you can imagine we don't just actually have that horsepower. Now, while I'm at this, I'll also show, play this graph, this one. This shows what, it, what is the state of art in vision. So in vision, the interesting thing is really, what are you doing? So in this case, you know, sort of like you think the system is recognizing, it's, a, it's thinking it's a wallet, it's a tea bag, it's a, so a lot of these vision uh, algorithm guys are, are, are looking at things like if I put a, uh, open, uh, pick up this glass or bottle, then they want to know that it's a glass of water. Because once they have that anal analysis, they can actually say something to it. That too requires tremendous amount of computation. Okay. Now, um, having said all this introductory stuff, let's now uh, start with some more meaty stuff. So, so uh, you know, let's start with ground truths. We started with uh, a certain ground truth la yesterday, so we're going to start with now today. So let's just say that, the, as I said, the, if you have a better quality path in the internet from your device to your cloud, you're going to have better quality services. Okay? High latency is going to degrade the services to some point that is actually useless. So if you were doing something like location determination, um, you know, uh, not as a toy application but as a product application, and, and the system could not react fast enough because it couldn't get the data to the computers, it's useless to you. Right? So latency matters. And then pro uh, poor performance affects revenues and things. All right. Now, uh, let's think of it very simply. I drew this graph, a little, uh, drew this picture a little differently, but uh, let's see what are the components of latency. Uh, there's a client, there's a network data, data centers. A request comes, the client does some processing, sends it over the network, the data center, the cloud does some processing, sends the results back, and then the client uh, gets it. Right? So it's pretty simple. So now, well, you can optimize for companies like Microsoft, for example, and Google to some extent, optimize the heck out of what is happening in the client, optimize the heck out of what is happening in the cloud, right? But they don't, they don't know really what to do because this is a much, much more complicated beast. So 
Uh, in fact, uh, uh, our folks in my group have done quite a lot of groundbreaking work that if you want to get into this area, you could read papers about, about how you optimize uh, networking in the data center so that the network is not the bottleneck at all inside the data center, which is that the, all the servers can run on line, line, line rate and send the data. So we haven't done much with the internet. Now, uh, I did this experiment uh, of, um, about a year and a half ago, maybe slightly more. But um, I haven't repeated it, but I suspect it's pretty similar. So all I, all I did was I took uh, <clears throat> my smartphone and I did a trace route to some Google site. This is the result of that, going over Wi-Fi. I did the same thing over 3G, and this is the result of that, going to the same IP address. And I guarantee you that if I do this experiment here, this list will either just go on and on, or I'll just get stopped here someplace. You know, it's just a, I mean, the networks are so slow. Now, the interesting thing is for big, large companies, we have no control over this, right? Same application getting about 11 hops. Here's 25 hops. Lots of distance. <laughs> that's, that's a problem. Now, to really understand what's going on, you must understand the internet. And uh, most of you know it, but just as a basic. So you have the data centers. And the way the internet works is you've got lots of these ISPs. Okay, I mentioned AT&T, Sprint, Comcast. Put in their Airtel. Put in their whatever local ISPs you have. And then these ISPs make deal with one another. There's a protocol actually called BGP, which allows you to, to sort of implement those policies and deals. So for example, when packets go from here or go back here, depending on what deal Comcast has with at and it'll either send it here or it'll send it in Sprint, or it'll dynamically choose depending on you know, uh, how, what time of day it is and who's had a congested link and things like that. And that's why. Because it has no sort of a clear path, that's why you see different hop counts and different, trace, uh, different results in trace count. And it's very complicated. And then there's a company, or uh, there's a uh, um, thing called Pier One. If you go and, and check their website, uh, this is an old number. But you can see these are AS numbers. Think of them as networks. This is the number of networks they had discovered. And this is actually a conservative estimate. All right, And this is the number of peering connections between the various networks. So now, if you have a, a packet that is flowing from your client to your, uh, uh, to your data center, and it's going through so many peers, you're going to have a latency problem, right? OK. Now, add to that, so I haven't said anything about mobile race so far. All I've talked about is latency cloud devices. But now, you guys work in mobile, or you work in wireless. Let's talk about wireless. Let's talk about cellular wireless for now. Cellular wireless stack looks something like this. Now, of course, I mean, changes for different things. It's just a sort of a representative uh, architecture. And you can imagine, so I have taken the internet and just put a bubble here. That whole complex internet I put as a little bubble, and all this is what is happening in this cell network. So this itself adds tremendous amount of complications and latency in itself. In fact, there have been many studies. Here's a sample of some uh, studies that were done. Well, this was done a few years ago. This came out last year. Talks about what is the latencies to some of these things. And so, uh, for example, AT&T has 350 milliseconds round trip latency, okay, about uh, average. And then T-Mobile is about 450 milliseconds. That's a long time. That's a huge time, as you will see at the end of this talk. Now, people say LTE is great, LTE is, but even LTE has a median latency of about 70 milliseconds with a lot of jitter in there. So that itself is also pretty large. Okay, so this is this is actually done by researchers, and you know, if you get into this field, you can do you can perform your some experiments because these things keep changing, but nevertheless, they are pretty large. Okay, so now if you know about TCP, then you know that this lounge, this RTT is actually way more than three. So when you say uh, the RTT is 350 milliseconds. The actual latency is a lot, lot, lot bigger. And the way is that the reason is the way we design our protocols. So if you take TLS or uh, TCP, you know it's a very chatty protocol. It has all this handshaking going on. And so by the time it does all its stuff and starts to move the traffic, you, if you plot here, this kind of shows, for example, an approximate 50 millisecond difference in RTT translates to 530 millisecond real latency in moving the objects. Okay. And this graph sort of tends to show, for example, there's an attempt of what the RTT is versus what the actual transfer time is based on TCP. So if somebody says 50 millisecond latency, you can think, ah, 50 milliseconds, I mean, what the hell, that's not too much. But it's actually a lot. It's a lot because as you transfer objects. Okay? So, uh, so you have to uh, bring that down. Now, if you don't believe any of what I said, there's actually, uh, we did this uh, thing. I, I haven't tried it here. 
you can download, if you have a Windows phone, you can download, or, or any Windows device, you can download this, um, this free app, run it, and it'll tell you um, what uh, your uh, networks are giving you. So when you hear anything in popular press, don't believe any of that. That's all SPR. This will give you hard data of what is going on in your networks, and then you start to see how bad these are. Okay? So this is uh, why I'd let you know about that. So now, now that we've established that hopefully you established latency is important, and hopefully established latency is really bad, and hopefully established that in mobile devices or wireless systems, wireless networks, it's even worse, then we have to think, okay, what can we do given this really complex state of affairs here? All right, so let's again start with the basics. So the idea then is when the packet leaves the client, they want to get to your computing device right away, they want to get to the cloud right away, right? Any time that is spent in the network is wasted time, and we want to avoid that. So you would think, well, let's bring the cloud closer to the client. Makes obvious sense. Like, you know, if it's going to go through all this stuff, not now worry about it. So then you say, well, let's build lots of data centers around the world and place them in strategic locations. That's exactly what, what everybody is doing. So there's just a little picture, uh, it's a sort of a thing, about these the mega data centers, what I call them as mega data centers or mass clouds. They have close to 200,000 servers in, in several buildings that are serving the world. And so lots of companies, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, are spending billions of dollars building these things around the world. Right? and then they're placing them in different places. And lots of countries want that this thing should be placed there. There are all these other issues, which like, if the data is going somewhere else, you know, all the people from my countries, data is going somewhere else, that's not a good thing, so you should place here. So companies have to deal with all that stuff because uh, effectively, it's the econo econ economics of the thing. You have to spend a lot of money, that's called CapEx, to, to build these, and then you have to spend a lot of OPEX, which is the operating cost to manage these uh, data centers across the world. And that costs a lot of money, too, because you know machines get old, you got to replace the machines, you got to get people to service them, and all kinds of stuff. So that's why this is what you're in the middle of is a transition from the old world that we had, which was about shrink wrap software and, so, and, and desktop devices uh, or computers under your desk, to a world which is all about cloud and all about uh, going uh, in the center of the universe and, uh, as a cloud. And we are sort of in the middle of that transition right now. And, and so it's actually quite exciting time. But that opens up a tremendous number of uh, uh, technical problems that people are solving. And that's where all the research is happening. If you go to all the uh, conferences and things, that's where it's happening. Now, so the question is, is this enough, right? Is this enough? <laughs> yes, no? Why? Like what? Right, right. Right, so the question is, um, so right, you're right. So, you know, is this enough? And the answer is no. And, they, and then the question is, what do you do next? You, you build more of these, right? But really, you can't really build more of these because they are really expensive. They are very, very expensive. It costs a lot of money. The money has to come in from somewhere for it to be spent, right? And as engineers, or, or you know, if people who are either going to go into research or academia or go into industry, this is a real problem that you don't have unlimited amount of money. So the next level of question, which uh, you may be thinking of, is like, forget these mega data centers. Let's build very small data centers. Let's call them micro DCs. And build thousands of these and build them all over the internet. Okay? So this is my uh, sort of an attempt at trying to draw a picture, try to visualize all this stuff. But imagine, instead of these bigger things, we build thousands of these things, which I call cloudlets or uh, micro DCs. And then what we do is we try to work very hard to create from that cloudlet to these mega clouds, we create some tunnels. There, the company says, OK, instead of building so many, uh, uh, so many mega data centers spending money there, I'm going to spend money on paying these ISPs to give me um, a very, very clean network from my cloudlet to my cloud. Or alternatively, if you don't do it, I'm just going to invest money and put fiber there and, and move it that way. Right? So then that way you can start to build. Now these cloudlets can be anything from one server to 40 servers. In fact, if you think about it uh, very intellectually or as research, 
Cloudlet can be anything. A Cloudlet can be my lap, excuse me, my laptop here, right? It could be a Cloudlet for my phone that is in my pocket. A Cloudlet could be something in the access point. But anyway, that's what you do. So I say four to forty, but you can imagine uh, one to uh, forty or, or more um, Cloudlets. And this this is actually a product that we we have. Microsoft has. This is a server rack, which is about in this particular case has twenty servers that are in the rack that we send to an ISP. He plugs it in, and then boom, they have a Cloudlet or a micro DCs. So Cloudlet is defined as resource-rich computing infrastructure with high-speed internet connectivity to the cloud. And I say resource-rich, I mean, uh, has a lot of computing power in it. And then the mobile devices use its infrastructure to augment its capability to, be, uh, to enable the applications that we didn't think it was possible in the past. Because now you're going to try to cut down on latency, you're going to provide computing very close to it, and then you're going to offload stuff in there. All right, so what can a Cloudlet do? One thing that they actually do already in some sense are the CDNs. You've heard of the CDN networks, right? So really what they do is do content caching. So in CDN, for example, in YouTube, you, if you want to download something, there is no reason to go to the cloud. If a cloud is there and it's download, uh, it has all the popular content, then you can just pass it from the cloud. Right? So you feel that the performance is pretty good because it comes right away. So this is the kind of stuff that people are already doing. The other thing that, sorry, the other thing that people understand is to do split TCP connection. So in, in TCP, if you know, understand TCP, you have this round trip thing and they have the window size and things. So what happens is when you send the packets, if packets get lost and the answer comes back, then the TCP will adjust itself. But if the path is very long, it'll take forever, right? It'll take forever as in, like, you know, it, the performance will be very bad. But most of the losses happen in the last hop. So it happens in wireless uh, part of the system, for example. So if you have a, a connection that splits right there, and then you have a more persistent connection from that cloudlet back to the, their data centers, then any losses that happen that are localized, you can actually fix very, very quickly, either in the link layer or even in the higher layers. But they don't affect the round trip latency, right? Because the, the back end is, is very helpful. Why don't people change the TCP algorithm? Right. So the end, that, that question actually comes up all the time. And uh, it's very frustrating to many researchers. Like, why the heck are we doing? The thing is, I think a lot of it has to do with uh, sort of, um, I mean, the simple answer is about legacy. There are so many applications out there that do so much. The other is people have attempted to come up with, to decouple, for example, the congestion control part of the TCP protocol with the actual semantics. And they've tried to push that in, but the adoption is very slow because people are, uh, I mean, unless it gets to a very painful point, those changes don't tend to happen as, e as easily. So. Than, uh, much right. It is simpler. In fact, uh, in fact, when I say split TCP, the uh, connection from the cloudlet to the cloud doesn't have to be TCP. Okay, so that can be anything you want. In fact, there are proprietary protocols that people do because both ends you control. If you control both ends, you do whatever you want. It's only between the client and the edge that you can because who knows whose client you're using. Right? You can use any operating system with anything and because you've got a standardized thing, you have to uh, have TCP. Yes? Yeah. It will uh, it may potentially improve it, but won't solve it. The even like I said, you're still so long as you're still um, uh, held back with the with the actual protocol, the way it works, and adhering to all the standardization, you're not going to actually solve it. You're going you, to there are people have written on like uh, hundreds of papers on trying to improve TCP performance. So I wouldn't say it solves it. It just uh, exactly. But you know that's not the main issue. I don't want you to get hung up on TCP. There are other other things going on. But what I what I did want to say to you is that this thing people understand. So for example, by doing a split TCP or or it's also called SSL domination. So if you're doing HTTPS, then uh, uh, we found that uh, just uh, from a little bit of experiment that you could shave off about 30 milliseconds round trip, which is pretty substantial because 30 milliseconds then amounts to uh, taking that 30 milliseconds and using it for computation, and that then gives you relevancy, uh, which is uh, pretty large, let's say. The other thing you can do is our routing, and I'll say a few words about it. And then if you kind of go to the web and you search for CDNs, you will see hundreds of companies, starting with Akamai, Limelight, CloudFront, Level3, Edgecast, they provide these CDN services, content distribution services, which do caching. So there's, this is a very, very mature market. People already do that. Now. So what I wanted to make a distinction was between the cloudlets that are uh, that are classic CDN, so they do some sort of caching, but really what they are is are about computation. These guys that I talk about do very little computation. They don't actually do any application level computation or anything. 
but but cloudlets are do okay so in terms of just uh, just to sort of complete what i was saying here about overlay network diversity so if you have multiple cloudlets and these cloudlets are connected to one another then they can actually collaborate with each other to figure out what the best path is so a simple example of that is there is these cloudlets and they you're trying to get to let's say you're trying to get from site 1 to site 3 then um, you know you can kind of go this way or you can kind of go this way or you can go different ways and so if different cloudlets are keeping their uh, keeping the quality of the path from there to that particular site then they can collaborate with each other and do make, make routing decisions on top of the routing decisions that the ISPs have to do some improvements on it okay but let's be let's talk more about mobility and wireless because that's really what uh, you guys are mo most interested in so let's talk about very something very very fundamental to to wireless and mobility and that's battery life right i don't know if there's been any talk here of anybody talking about energy or battery life but huge topic massive topic very difficult in tons of work you can give a full lecture a full day worth of lecture on that topic but i'm assuming you all understand uh, the issues maybe not the precise think where we are so in batteries so uh, <clears throat> what happens is uh, I want to tell you a little bit about fast dormancy so the way uh, things work in um, in uh, uh, cellular networks is that you are uh, so this is numbers from Verizon from 2011 this is 1.6 watts here this is uh, 0, 0.0 watts so when you have uh, you 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 want to transmit data you have to trans you transmit it then uh, the system allows you to go down to a slightly lower power of one watt then you have to stick around for a certain amount of time then you can go to the lower power now why I'm showing you this is because really if you're not transmitting you really should not be using any energy right ideally you should transmit turn the system off when you want to transmit again or receive or whatever you wake it up do the thing and then turn it off that's how you save battery really that there's no other magic to it it's just sleep as much as you possibly can okay so um, so, but to, to explain to you how cloudlets help improve battery life, I have to give you some history here, okay? So, some history is that uh, several years ago, uh, four years ago actually, I guess, um, there was a lot of uh, bad press in, uh, uh, in the U.S. about how the iPhone network, how, how the iPhone brought down AT&T cellular network, okay? So, this is just a cutout of those. This is September 2, 2009. Uh, De December 12, 2009, customers anger over iPhone overload to AT&T, AT&T is to blame. So, uh, you know, AT&T's network was really down. Do you, does anybody know about this? Because, no? You, you do. Do you remember why this was? Do you know what the... That was the, uh, after the delay of the time, immediately the, uh, the connection was finished and the mobile phones were not waiting for that. Yeah. That's very good. Yeah. So um, um, uh, she's actually right. Let me repeat what she said. And uh, very good. So I told you how you know the sort of the uh, fast dormancy works. So when uh, iPhone came out first and was very popular in New York, see these guys were thinking I got to save battery right for my phone. So what they would do is, uh, this is again the Verizon number, they would um, transmit the data, most of the web traffic, everything you do with your, I keep doing this because I have my phone, although I don't know where it is, so when I do this, that's what I'm trying to get my phone out. <laughs> anyway, so when you look at a phone and you sort of do a web transfer, it's a very bursty interaction, right? It sends, comes, sends, comes. And so what they did is they said, well, I'll send the data, as soon as the data is done, I'll bring the phone down to the lowest power level and then do it this way. That's how they said, it made sense, right? Because you don't want to waste energy just hanging around. Well, what happened is um, the network, the cellular networks are built, inherently built as uh, a circuit switch networks, not packet switch networks. Long time ago when the telephone network was brought, it was a circuit switch network and it actually works beautifully. So what a circuit switch network is, you, whenever you make a call and you dial some number, a whole, uh, 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 there's a lot of signaling that happens to set up resources along the path as the signal is set from, uh, uh, from the client to the destination, from, right? And then when you are done, it brings down, uh, another signal is sent to bring down and clean up all the resources so that the next fall can come. Well, so the wireless network inherited that same thing. So what would happen is you would connect, a signal would be sent across the entire network, all the resources would be set up, 
And as soon as you see the, did the transfer, you brought it down, and so a signal would be sent to bring all the resources down. Okay? So now imagine how much data transfer people do when they do web. I mean, they're just doing all the time. They bring some packets and look at it, they bring it from packet again. So now all these phones, these millions of phones, started to send signals, up signals, down signals, up signals, down signals, and the system just could not handle it. It just broke. Basically, it stopped functioning because you know, it got into all these states that they had never been uh, tested for, and it just broke. And then you started to hear all of that stuff. So these mobile operators realized this right away and said, this, this is really problematic. And so what they said is, okay, well, you can't really bring the system down, right? What you have to do is, I mean, you have to, radio, you have to keep it up. I'll let you go to this one point, uh, this uh, one watt thing, and then you have to stay with me for a certain amount of time before you bring it up. Now, this does two things. One, it sort of uh, uh, fixes the hysteresis, and it allows you to sort of wait, or the phone does not send a signal for a while, and because it doesn't send a signal for a while, and um, the, the, there is not as much overload. And then, if you, for example, if they choose this number T, right, then as more transfers happen, then you've basically eliminated these other down signals that you needed to send, and so there's no setup up front going on. Okay, so the T that they chose for LTE was approximately 10 seconds. So once you start a transfer, you got to be up for 10 seconds after the transfer is over, right? That's what they did. Now, that's a lot, but it's, I mean, in terms of saving, uh, uh, losing energy. 10 seconds, you just waked up and at, at the highest power level or, you know, one watt and not doing anything. So this is the, the, the thing. Now, um, this is not a good thing, okay? This is not a good thing. So the patch was sent. In fact, all your phones do this pretty much. Really what you want is this behavior. You do want the phones to shut down, right? But you can't sort of fix the networks. That's a lot of cost. So then cloudlets can help because what the cloudlets can do is if a cloudless is at the edge, it can be the proxy for that network. And if it's a proxy, what it does is the phone actually can go down, right? I don't know if this picture uh, shows it. The phone, uh, phone uh, transfers goes down, but the cloudlet suppresses that signal and keeps the network thinking that it's up. And then after 10 seconds are over, it then sends the signal out. And so the network gets what it wants, and the phone gets what it wants, and you are able to save some energy. So if you do this sort of uh, thing, then if you look at it's a very simple equation, energy transfer is 1.6 watts plus the speed up. The speed up comes from the fact that you actually have a cloud so you, know, you can send the data quickly and then go to sleep, and you're not waiting for a round trip, so that's your speed up. Plus one watch times nine seconds, because that's the time you would have had to wake up for uh, for that means about for every transaction you save about 10.6 joules of energy. Now, if you take a regular phone like a Samsung phone and you apply this thing, and then you sort of say, "Well, I'm going to take 20 network transfers um, in," uh, uh, so that could be notifications and um, uh, emails, etc., in one hour, which is not too much actually. If I, I think about the way I work, use my phone, I'm using it all the time, and I'm not doing. I'm looking at it and I sync it and all that stuff. So 20 is not too much you can save 26% of the battery. And if you work in battery, and if you have ever taken any course, or if you understand, this is a huge number. People have been struggling for ages to, to try to improve battery life, and they're not able to do it. But this, this sort of uh, saving is huge. Now, if you sort of go to the limit and you gra draw this graph, you, this is the network uh, on the horizontal axis, the number of uh, network transfers per hour. This is the battery saved. You start to see this is what happens if you didn't do that system that exists today. And you can save up to 70, depending on how many transactions you do, you can save 75% of your uh, battery lifetime you can improve. This is huge, and this is true for all mobile devices, okay? So this is true for, so this is a big, big saving. This is so, uh, these are sort of the things you can do. And uh, so this a slide shows that battery power has been tremendously hard to, to, to solve. So this is uh, how many years, and this is sort of how the battery power is improving. There is no magic bullet here. In fact, uh, if you put too much energy into a battery and make it strong, uh, make it smaller and smaller, it's really making a bomb. You, know, you don't want to make bombs, right? You want to make batteries. So um, um, in the time that the CPU has improved by a factor of 250 almost, um, uh, battery has improved by like 2x or 3x. So it's really, really bad. Okay, so that's one thing a cloudlet can do. Another thing that a cloudlet can do is, um, I'm going to speed up a little bit here is competition offloads. I started the topic with that. So the question about competition offload is that you want certain parts of your application to work on your phone and certain part of it to be work on the cloud. So now the questions from a research and engineering perspective is what do you offload? How much of it do you offload? What do you offload? 
how to dynamically decide whether it's a good idea to offload or not because the network can be really bad and if you're trying to offload and the network is going up and down, that's not a good idea, you don't want to do it. And then how do you do it without making the life of a programmer very hard? If the program has to think all the time about, oh, I should offload, offload you're going to not win. So uh, this is just a code I guess I picked up, it doesn't really matter, but this guy is a, is a huge game developer and really what, what this code is saying is that uh, I don't want to uh, deal with any of these issues that you're telling me about, right? Because I just want to be able to program my games and just focus on the game. And so all this stuff has to happen in the, in the system itself without the application writer ever having to worry about it. So there are uh, several ways to, to do cloud offloading. I'm just pointing out a few. Uh, we had this system called MAUI, and I'll describe that to you, and there are some papers on it too. The UCS had a system called Odessa. Intel had a system called Clone Cloud, and there was another one. Um, uh, called Orleans. And the way uh, they sort of work is, for example, the Microsoft system, which I'll go into in just in a minute, basically offloads methods, right? Uh, uh, think of them as procedures and things like that. Uh, this one does threads, that one does task grains. So there are different ways of looking at this problem, and you can decide which one you like the best. So in terms of uh, the Microsoft system, the MAUI, which uh, I was involved with, I built. So you build uh, uh, the, the application, uh, the programmer builds the applications. Um, and then, uh, without thinking much, but what it does, what he does is when you're doing in .NET, there's a tags that you can add. So you can add uh, some hints in the program. So when you start a method, you can say, this method is remotable. What that means is that as you're writing a program, you can sort of say, well, this is a sort of a method that is uh, self-contained. I don't actually have to, there's not much dependency. This probably can be put, uh, can go somewhere else. And so you just tag it on top, remotable, uh, start, begin, right? That's all you do. Now, that doesn't mean that's telling the system that you it actually has to do. The system is going to make that determination itself, but it'll get a, a sense of what is uh, what things it needs to look at more carefully. Okay, so for example, as you're writing some code, you will write this, you will just add this tag called remotable, and you can define these tags in, in Visual Studio and Dotman framework and things like that. So what the MAUI runtime does is when your uh, application is starting to run, or um, uh, it will actually look at these tags and it will split the methods okay, at runtime uh, as in terms of um, uh, optimizing for some uh, characteristics. Like it might be optimizing for performance or it might be optimizing for energy, uh, like I said. And um, okay, so then <clears throat> now uh, there is some subtlety here. The subtlety has to do with um, deciding that uh, uh, somebody would ask the question that why does it have to happen in runtime? Why don't we just sort of decide upfront and then do a static split? And the answer is actually you can't do static splits because uh, what if you've moved something on the cloud and uh, that the network went down? Then what would you do in that case? So for example, if you're buying something from Amazon and you down uh, you uh, the part of the code that goes and purchases or moves the credit card into Amazon is is on the cloud and it goes and does its thing and the network goes down. Uh, what are you going to do? I mean, are you going to go do another purchase or not? So the semantics start to, to matter. So you can't really do this in, in statically. You do it uh, dynamically, and I'll explain to you how. So really, very quickly, uh, on the smartphone, on the device, you can have, um, you can have a, a sort of a, here's your application, here's the runtime, you can have, which contains a client proxy, a profiler, and a solver. And on the cloud side, you have the same thing. You have a server proxy uh, profiler and the solver. And think of them as being talking to one another through some RPC calls or whatever. So when um, when the application is run, it gets intercepted by the MAUI runtime, and then uh, the runtime will then decide whether to actually run that uh, particular uh, piece of code here or run it on the server on based on some basis. And I'll tell you. And then uh, it if it runs on the server, it'll synchronize the state between the server and the client and essentially run it. Now, uh, the profiler, let's sort of talk about the profiler really quickly. So the profiler sort of has this call graph, which is how all these methods are set up. And then it, has, uh, it also takes execution time, which can be determined offline. So these things are, by the way, all offline. This is uh, uh, online. The amount of memory, amount of things it needs to transfer, that's your state service, the CPU cycles, how much device energy uh, that particular method will consume. And what is the network latency at the particular time, and what is the network type, Wi-Fi, 3G, or whatever, right? Based on that, what it does, it, it uh, so this is the call graph. Call graphs, if you understand, are, this is method A calling method B, which might call method C, which also might call method D. So it's going to tag this call graph by something like, for example, it says it takes 445 millijoules to run this, and it takes about 30 milliseconds, 
and the state transfer from here to b uh, from a to b is about 10 kilobytes so it will create this and then uh, 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 data for itself okay so once it does that then uh, you have a decision engine which will then has to partition as it partition the the thing so what it does is now it uh, looks at this whole curl graph and start, thinks of it as a linear program. Now, what is the optimization function? The optimization function is that you want to maximize the energy that is saved. So let's say you're optimizing for energy at this point, right? Maximize the energy saved, subtract by the cost of the offload because uh, there is energy used in computing and there's energy used in communicating. So if you're going to send data out, that's going to consume ener energy, right? So if you and if you send the data, all the uh, energy that is used for running that is attributed to the cloud, and you're not using it. So that's your energy saved. The cost of offload is the energy that you use in offloading that data, right? That's so you you want to maximize this because you want to maximize saved energy in such a way that the execution time uh, for the whole system plus the time of offload, right, takes to go and then come back. That is um, uh, uh, below a certain threshold. Really, that's what you're doing. Because you want to do all this. I mean, if it's going to take forever, then you don't want to do it. If, you, if it takes less than a certain time, then you do it. And so you, the reason to show this equation is not to uh, sort of give you a sense of the um, anything. But my point here is that a problem, which is like kind of a, a software problem that traditionally one would think about, lends itself pretty well to some good theory work that you can use to decide what the system must do. And that's exactly what, what is being done here. It's being, everything has been modeled in a particular way. You get all the right numbers, parameters, you measure them, and then you, based on this, you, you make the decisions in runtime. Okay? Now let me show you the results of this stuff. Now of course you want details, there are papers, so can, you can read the papers and you can understand the details and you might decide you can actually do a better job. And that's perfectly reasonable. In fact, people who have read this paper have come back to me and said, hey, can, why don't you do this, why don't you do that? And that's perfectly reasonable. Yeah. No. Why? I mean, it's an integer in a program, right? Yeah, I mean, so yeah. You might have good approximation algorithms, but no. Uh, I mean, it's an ILP, right? I mean, ILP is not uh, trivial. Yeah, it's not trivial to solve, but they, why is it? And I mean, this is uh, not, this is set up. So I'm not actually sure why you're saying NP hard. I, let me uh, get back to you, okay, because I, I just realized I'm really way behind. But I will definitely take this uh, question with you uh, just offline, right? Because otherwise we'll go into a rat hole here a little bit very quickly. So anyway, if looking, the, looking at the uh, graph here, what this shows is, um, this shows, uh, for example, the execution duration. This shows, uh, this is a face recognition algorithm, by the way, right? And what it's showing is that uh, uh, when I say, uh, uh, smartphone only, so everything is being done in the smartphone when you uh, when you're executing, trying to recognize a face, and this is done in the cloud. And what you see is these l legends that are here represent how much RTT you have to the cloud. So you got 10 milliseconds, you're looking at this. If you got 25 milliseconds, you're looking at this. If you got uh, 220 milliseconds, you're looking at this. So you can clearly see that you can do things much faster in the cloud, right, uh, than you can do it on the smartphone even when the RTT is so high, because the smartphone just doesn't have the horsepower to do it. Now, just to prove to you that the system actually works, this is a different graph. This is about energy. That was about execution speed. Same legend, right? And here, what you see is when the RTT is large, then it is actually better to do it, to say, do it in the phone. You will save energy here. In fact, our system does not allow it to go here because it was higher. So we had to hard code and just remove it and to see to generate this graph. And here it is showing that no, stay in the smartphone side, don't send it because the amount of time you have to send to communicate and wait for the radio not to be turned down and things like that is just too much. All right. So here's I'm going to show you a thing that my intern did. Um, she's I don't know if you know Dina Kadavi, but she's her student, uh, not Dina, sorry, uh, Hari Balakrishnan student. And so this is uh, let's see, I hope it works now. So what is going on here is <laughs> she's just taking a video of a smartphone of people walking, right? Now she's going to do face recognition with the cloudlet, which is only five milliseconds latency. It's going to go very fast. But what it's doing is it's recognizing seven faces. In real time, it's recognizing seven. Now we're going to move the cloudlet about 85 milliseconds in latency. And we're going to do the exact same state-of-art algorithm. 
and then you see it still recognizes, but now it recognizes only four faces, right? Which means latency, just because of latency, you got 100 percent recognition versus you got, you know, uh, uh, close to 55, 60 percent recognition. So, so it matters. Okay. Now, the interesting, the reason I want to show you that is because it is not just about face recognition or any computation intensive algorithms. It is about everything, but let's, let's decompress this or, or decode the face recognition. So in face recognition, you do face detection, right? Then you do the alliance, some sort of alignment or uh, things. Then you do feature extraction from that, and then you do feature matching or, or pattern matching to figure out what uh, features it corresponds to, so what face we're looking at. And then underneath is, is the time for each of these things. Now this thing shows for this much of an image, if you just do it in client side, this is about 800 milliseconds. If you do it in the server side, 130. So it's clearly doing this in server is a good thing. Now this graph is the most interesting graph uh, that uh, we generated here. What this shows is how much time is required and then uh, what is the accuracy of the system and what is the feature count. So what this is doing is, as you can see, as you increase the number of features you extract from it, your accuracy goes up. Of course, after a while it's law of diminishing returns, but you can see that uh, when you extract uh, something like uh, 14,000 uh, 14, uh, yeah, 14, features, it's the accuracy is close to 90, 92 percent versus, let's say, here, right? And but you also notice that you need more time in the computation, correct? So that's what I've been sort of saying again and again, which is that if you uh, if you put this time in the network versus in the computation, you're not going to be able to succeed. So any company, anything that is able to cut that network speed considerably, will win because they will just put that time into the computation and get it. Now, what is interesting is this is true for many things, not just object recognition, which is the next uh, generation of applications. Even for things like speech recognition or search, which is what we do today, it's the same thing. It's the same boxes, really. In search, I don't know if you understand the way search works. You, when you do a search, uh, many, many threads are spawned in uh, like this large, massive index that is sitting in the server, and there's a, think of it as a pattern recognition algorithm. It's going in trying to match against something. And after a certain time, 200 milliseconds, it cuts it off and says, give me all the results you have, takes the results, renders it, sends it back to the mobile device, and you see all the results. Now, when you say, oh, uh, Google's results are better or Microsoft's results are better, the relevancy algorithms, there's not much difference between them or us. There isn't because, you know, we all understand how to do things. Everybody's smart. They're smart. We're smart. We can all do that. What happens is how, who is spending more time doing the brute force search? If you get more search there, more time there, you get better results. And so people spend millions of dollars trying to actually fix that. And that the same thing is true for speech recognition too. So this thing will come, keep coming again and again. I just want to show you object recognition because if somebody ever says to you whatever, oh, this is for the future apps, and so you're talking to somebody and saying, hey, you know, this is not, the, uh, we have it pretty good now. No, you actually don't. Okay. So now going back to the cloudlets, um, uh, uh, the things that I sort of talked about, uh, uh, mentioned very clearly was, uh, uh, early was that, Let's build uh, systems where we have a network that is much better from the cloudlet to the cloud. Uh, we can do overlay routing, and uh, this is a path diversity thing. We have a picture on this too. Path diversity shows that if, if a cloudlet is connected to multiple ISPs, so for example, if there are three DCs, it's got two ISPs, you have six, uh, you know, you can do up to six different ways of getting to the cloud, and you can sort of decide which is the best path, and you can do all this stuff. So this is all good, okay? So let me uh, say a few more words about uh, offloading, uh, about, uh, about bandwidth, okay? Now bandwidth is very important in countries like India. It's very important in all the, in fact, it's very important everywhere depending on the pricing structure. But, but so what uh, cellular network guys do is they, they try to offload as much as they possibly can to Wi-Fi. And we talked a little bit about that yesterday as well. Now, so, uh, so one technique is you offload. The other technique is you compress aggressively. Ram has actually done uh, some work there is to sort of do uh, compression so that you're not using as much, um, as much bandwidth. Another idea is to do what, is called, what we call a procrastinate. Now, the way these things work is when you do an app, for example, a weather app, when you run the app, what it does, is it just assumes you're going to bring a lot of these maps that you're going to look at. So if you go to the next page, of the app, you'll see a radar map of the place, right? Or in the next page, you get another, some other map. So what it does is it aggressively, in order to improve performance for you, it'll bring all these maps. Now, you might decide, I don't even want to go, I'm not going to do the map. You just look at the first page. It tells you what the weather, you shut it down and move forward. But all that bandwidth has been wasted because, and, it, and you're paying for it, right? That's not good design. So uh, the idea is then that this MDC or this cloudlets 
which are very close to you now, they are not uh, 70, 80 milliseconds to hit you in the performance, they will bring everything for you, but they will not pass it to you. But now when you sort of like, if you go to the next page, because they're only a few milliseconds away, they'll send it to you, and you will hopefully not see the difference. So uh, really, uh, so this graph, for example, shows, uh, you know, we tested this against many applications, and what we found is, for example, some application, it doesn't matter. The green is what it does in terms of how much bandwidth or how many uh, uh, bytes it brings down. And the red is how much it uses. The blue is how much you save if you do what I just said, which is don't bring it down till it's needed. You procrastinate, right? And so in some applications, you can see the blues are pretty large. It's pretty large here, pretty large in the weather app. In some other, like USA Today, where the content is a lot more dynamic and things like that, and you only bring after you've uh, clicked a link, you don't actually gain some uh, as much things. And to tell you how it actually feels like, so to show you a little video here. So this is how the world works today. You've got a weather channel. Uh, you know, you start the application. So it's bringing, now it goes to the next page. And uh, it, takes, it takes time. So this is what, what we did in this particular demo is to sort of say, we'll only bring the data when he goes to the next slide, right? I'm going to run it just one more time. So because I bring the thing, you bring this first page. Now when he hits it, he will bring the, uh, so there's a, a delay. And now the map shows up. You don't want that. Application writers don't want that. So with a cloudlet, this is what happens. So you have an app. He goes to the next page. Oh, sorry. I'm looking there. I don't know if you saw that. I was because my focus was on something else. I'll do it again. He does the same thing. Uh, he looks at the app. Uh, he's and now he hits it. And voila, it's there. You don't even see it. You don't even see. It. And his exact same thing has happened there, by the way. It still brought it, but the cloudlet is saving it. Okay. Now, um, there are other things too, but I need to wrap up uh, uh, quickly. So another idea is um, uh, sort of uh, you, if you want to uh, run some applications in the cloud and you want to uh, play them on the mobile device, then what you do is you bring, uh, you, if, the, if you're closer to the, cl uh, in the cloud, then you can actually do much. For example, if you, if you run an app and if it's a, sort of a touch app and if you click, if you sort of move it like Hungry, what is it called, Hungry Birds or something, if, if it's running in the cloud, <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you my age. Okay, well, you know, yeah, Hungry Birds I play. I'm like level 10 <laughs> or whatever. Anyway, if you play it, so if you have a lot of, if it's running in the cloud and if you sort of like, you know, try to get the bird to move or things, you will see it's just not going to be playable, so it's useless. So uh, you can do that by, by running this in the cloud. Like, okay. Uh, the other things here are, I'll leave the slides that you can take a look at them later, but really to make it all economical, some of the problems one has to solve is, you can't actually devote one server per machine, per client. You can't do that, right? Because it's just too expensive to do it. So what you're going to do a multi, what is called multi-tenancy. That means you're going to have one server devoted to many, many, many apps. The more you can do in one server, the better it is from an economics perspective. So then you have to think very hard about how do I schedule these things? How do I decide who to service first? And how do I decide how to pack it all in? So that's all uh, uh, multi-tenancy stuff. And uh, you do a, a bunch of other things too. Now, so, so there are many benefits of this cloud-led concept that I've talked about, right? So to caching in SSL domination is already there, compression people already do, but all this other stuff in the black is not being done. This is all open territory. This is where, again, I, uh, you know, I'm uh, maybe sounding too much uh, producty, but uh, let me just say that you know, if people want to do startups or new companies and things like that, there's a tremendous amount of potential to build these things and do a lot of good stuff here. Uh, by, by adding all these things, and this is all going to come. Okay, let's talk very quickly about deployment of these, how will it work. So in wireless networks, the way things work is you've got, you got dumb, what we call is dumb access points, what I call is dumb access points, and smart wireless switches, right? That's, for example, Wi-Fi deployed here. The access point is just a simple dumb device, takes the packet, send it to a switch, switch has got all the intelligence. And so you've got all these clients talking to AP, AP talking to wireless switch. Well, let's put a cloud layer right there. Because your packets are coming there, you can start doing this. That's uh, one deployment strategy. So you can sort of like work all these Wi-Fi vendors can now, in, when they sell you the switch, they can actually sell you a, 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 a server, a one server, two server, depending on what your needs is. So that's one strategy to do. And it's all very good. Now I'm going to show you uh, cloud-based gaming. And I want to show you once again how, uh, how you can do cloud-based gaming, which is a pretty good deal to do, eh? but um, why you can't do it with the clouds, okay? So let's uh, uh, do this. 
So uh, this is just uh, punching. Uh, this guy uh, is Wado. He's uh, you know here's the latency, five millisecond latency. As he clicks on it, you can see the thing punch. Now everything is running in the cloud right now. So increase the 30 millisecond latency. I don't know if you can notice the difference now in his click and the punch, right? 80 millisecond latency. You can certainly start to notice the kick, uh, the punching. Now let's do it in a real gaming uh, or turning, right? So let me actually well, let's oops. Uh, he'll just go to a real. Uh, he's like a seasoned gamer, and I'm going to show you uh, how 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 the impact is. But you can see he's struggling at 80 milliseconds. He's starting to struggle with the game. So now this is the game you really want to play on your device. So with five milliseconds, uh, five millisecond latency, he's shooting. I don't know what game it is. Uh, what is it? Oh my God! Doom three. Okay, <laughs> this is Doom. But you can see him killing, right? He's doing really well. He's shooting, because he's, he's a seasoned gamer. You can shoot everybody, everybody's dying, blood's coming out, heads are rolling. So now you have 30 milliseconds play. So now you see that he's actually getting hit more. Same guy, he's actually getting hit because he's not able to react as fast, right? I mean, he can react, but the game is not reacting fast. So see, now he's getting hit. Again, he's getting closer, closer, closer. So. He can't get him. I, mean, I don't know if you noticed in the previous case he got. And imagine what happens now. Then he goes to. See, he's getting hit again. That's blood. His blood coming out, I think. <laughs> okay, now he makes it. He's going to die. Same guy. He can't handle it anymore. So you basically changed the whole game. Right? And he's going to say, screw it. I'm not going to play this game. He'll die. Poor guy will die. So focused. Oh. Um, so anyway, um, so I talked about Wi-Fi. So the way we done it, did the five millisecond was put a cloudlet in the Wi-Fi. Small cells, which is the topic that's coming up. So I'm not going to say too much about small cells. But small cells is yet another way uh, to do it. But before I do that, let me tell you about cellular networks. Because that's where we always stand. If you do it in the cellular networks, you really can't do because LTE is 70 milliseconds. You got you know this kind of bandwidth now. Of course, you can get larger bandwidth. I know you can. But uh, let me just sort of say that uh, a lot of the measurements in different places we have seen, this is what the measurement, uh, this, is the, this is the kind of bandwidth we get. Now, um, but you can now solve this problem through small cells. Small cells increase capacity. They actually do a lot better. Where small cells are, and uh, again, this is very quick because this is probably the topic of uh, the next uh, presentation is that you can imagine a cellular network with much smaller footprint size in terms of um, the cell being a lot smaller. And so you can put, a, a theoretically, you can put a small cell. In fact, they do femto cells inside the house, right? Now, so this is kind of like what, what Wi-Fi is, but it's on a cellular device. So you don't have to do any Wi-Fi. Your same cell phone works everywhere. But now you can actually get a lot better things. So we have deployed, um, hang on. So, so yeah, similar footprint as Wi-Fi. Um, it has all the good stuff with the, the billing authentication. Works in the license frequencies. It can work on unlicensed, but license frequencies. SON is a, a self-organization networks, etc. So we deployed this in our on our campus uh, to small cell. In fact, with the help of Qualcomm. And what you start to see is we have 0 0.3 milliseconds delay between our cloud between the device and the small cell. And so now you can put a cloudlet right there. And then, uh, as opposed to, for example, if you're going to the internet. Uh, this is what it's showing, and uh, these are some numbers that we have seen. Um, for example, uh, uh, this is uh, right there is LTE, and here is uh, your small cell performance that we have uh, seen. So we've seen up to 110 megabits per second uh, uh, throughput, and then uh, delays of one millisecond. So small cell again are a potential place where cloudlets can be added, and you can do a lot of the computational offloads and and win. There's a whole lot of uh, small cell people. Now this is not just so. I wanted to give you a sense of this whole thing about cloudlets is, is uh, is a very big deal these days. Okay, so I've seen uh, many talks now. Uh, it was a uh, uh, it was a term that coined by us, uh, me specifically, along with Satya. We have an original paper on this. But nevertheless, I see, for example, um, here's the um, chief scientist in Intel giving a uh, in, uh, in Intel giving a talk uh, with devices and a, a server sitting right there, which is sort of a cloudlet. Then uh, this VP actually uses the word cloudless based on uh, uh, cellular or uh, cellular infrastructure, and then you see other things like Nokia Siemens has, is designing certain things. 
uh, is, is computing to boost uh, base station computing, which is again uh, putting computing right at the base stations to boost performance. And then there's an IBM Nokia Siemens uh, thing as well going on. Here's another picture from uh, uh, where is this from? This is from uh, somebody. Liquid, yeah, Nokia Siemens. So you see on the base station, you see a software track. Now this is very different from the world as the world used to be, the world that I was part of for a long time. Now, you know, because uh, none of these ISPs want to be like a pipe. They want to be able to do things and, and charge you more money for it. So now in the, in the base station, they're actually writing software stacks that can provide you many of the services that I talked about. So this is one product that they're trying to sell. Um, I just pointed out base station application architecture. I mean, who had heard about any of that stuff? So uh, going back, um, the, um, and, and if you look at some of the uh, mobile operators, you will see that they are buying out companies like Akamai bought out this uh, company um, uh, called um, uh, Velocitude. They also bought out this other company called Contendo for so much money. And these companies were just doing mobile acceleration for mobile devices. So then Cloudlets really are classic CDNs. As I said, uh, they have uh, a, bit, a lot of multi-tenant uh, edge computing with overlay networking. They can be so many uh, servers, as I mentioned, and they can be uh, really good for mobile. I want to leave you with one thought. The thought is the following, which is that the world, as we have known, as you may have heard about, is this. Forget the edges. This is this. Lots of cloud, lots of data centers, mega data centers that are being built. But now, in the next five, 10 years, I predict it's going to change. It's going to change uh, drastically. And lots of little players are going to be able to play. In the old days, only the big player with lots of money in their pocket could play because they are the only ones who can build. But imagine a franchise model where you rent a place and you buy or go to the Microsofts of the world or the big Googles of the world and say, I want to you know, uh, serve, as, create a micro DC center or a cloudless server and go and write to them. And they give you a rack of servers. You put the rack of servers, you provide network to it, you provide uh, power to it and you become a cloudlet, which is part of this big data centers. Not unlike how the ISPs grew up in the world. ISPs, they're little ma and pa ISPs that have existed, there are thousands of them in the world in villages, entrepreneur people who will say, well, I will provide the internet connection and do, do the right thing for the community to provide, make money. So this whole cloud computing is going to become a lot more like disaggregated computing. Now the challenge, technical challenge there is of course to make it all happen. But right now we spend tremendous amount of time to optimize here. Right now, you have to optimize across space. So even if you say there's a 40 servers per rack, and you have a thousand of these, that's 40,000 servers. 40,000 servers are not a small amount. You double it, that's 80,000 servers. Somebody's got to manage these 80,000 servers. Somebody has to make sure that they actually are working well. They're doing exactly everything. These uh, lead to tremendous technical problems. Then you have to think about you know the mobile part of this. How are you going to work with the mobile part? You think about the networking part of it. So. There's a slew of problems that one has to look at. Very interesting problems, very big problems, and they, consume, they will consume us for the next uh, several, several years. So I'll leave you with that thought, and hopefully it allows you to think a little differently from, from all the other things we've talked about. OK. Any? It better be good. <laughs> <laughs> One question. I know, I know. That's why I didn't want to indulge because I was worried about the time. Any thoughts? You don't have to have questions. Any thoughts, any comments? The, if you want to is, dispute this, what I said. This is one oh. thought. Like uh, nowadays, the mobile platforms are uh, growing rapidly. That means we can have 1.2 gigahertz of processing in the mobile itself. So what do you think this offload thing is uh, really going to matter? I mean, do you really offload because uh, mobile platforms 1.2 gigahertz, 2 GB RAM, 4 GB RAM, all the things are coming up. So, uh, are you really going to because number of that energy graph? Uh, the energy required for milliseconds of RTP, that also not very impressive energy required. So, ultimately, what matters is energy in the long run. Mm -hmm. So as the mobile platforms are growing rapidly, so do you think this offload thing will actually make sense in I think question? you're answering your own question. Does anybody want to answer her question? Yeah, yeah. If you take care of the energy along with your power part of it, you will Yeah. So I think you answered your own question by saying, yes, so there's, uh, there's a compute angle to that. And what you're saying is, that, hey, the computing horsepower is going up. Can we do more? Now remember, 
Bill Gates, who is the richest man or the second richest man in the world, actually is famously, huh? It is richest? Yeah. He said, he's famously known to have said, you don't need that much computing power, uh, you know, uh, in your thing. So even if you think that today the computing power that you're coming up with is enough, it's not enough. Because you haven't even touched the surface of the kinds of things one, one needs to do for processing. That's part one. Part two is that you have to admit that the servers will always be more powerful than the device no matter what. The second thing is that, yes, energy and even the, the uh, heat. I don't know if you know, my thing gets very hot. If you have a mobile device which is computing very fast, it's going to get very hot. That's not going to work too. So I think it's, it's a combination of all that stuff that uh, says that no, because you can't, because this thing doesn't even last me for a day, you know, you are going to have to offload. That's one. And the other thing is that when you do, for example, face recognition, you're doing matching against massive sets of databases. You're not going to download all that database on your cloud. Right? Say again? Right. So you're saying it's, it's very application dependent in which you want to recognize 10 faces and I already have the 10 faces. Sure, you can do, you can do that. There's nothing fundamental here except the fact that you're trying to optimize against certain parameters, right? And so uh, I'm just sort of saying that you're not going to get to the point where uh, you will have a win-win situation of doing all, everything on the phone. So long as you can do it in the cloud for you know. Maybe we should corner Vikram or uh, Vikram yeah. or lunch and yeah, continue the conversation. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry. Thanks. 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 Thanks.